Hi, welcome to spring. We're so excited you're here with us in our first spring cooking class with Pam Smith and Nicole Ramsland. We're happy to be here with you. Um, if this is your first time joining us, we hope that you're going to love it. We know you're going to love it. <laughs> Right. Yes, especially if you actually cook the meal and smell it and taste it. Amazing. But if you're not cooking, it's okay too. You can watch it as a culinary demonstration. I hear she has some experience with those. Uh, many of you know that I have had the incredible opportunity to host the Epcot International Food and Wine Festival. We're actually holding such a class um, for the last 22 years. Yes, I started when I was 12, but that don't do the math. But Every single year, what we do is we do dishes just like this, show the tips and techniques for you to become a top chef in your own kitchen. And for the last five years, we've been able to do that with PS Flavor. And we're so excited that you're right with us right now. I know some of you, yes, cooking. So this is a time, let's stop for just a moment and make sure that you go over to your oven and turn it to 400. And if you've not put your sheet pan in the oven, please do that as well, because we're gonna be getting to that in just a moment, but we want you to get that preheating. Okay, so sheet pan preheating at 400. We're gonna start cooking in about five minutes. We would like um, everybody to have a chance to get going. We know that you may be finishing up your mise en place. Everything in its place. Yes. On the Facebook group, the Cooking Club Facebook group, we have posted your recipe for the porcini pepper crusted steak. We've posted a grocery list, your prep sheet, and your wine pairing. And your wine pairing, which is what we're having our choice for that. If you look at that Pam's pairing, you'll see that I suggested a rather flashy Zinfandel but one that's earthy, one that has a, enough of a jamminess to be able to stand up to some of the really awesome flavors that are gonna come forth in this dish. A Zinfandel, a Nebbiola could do exactly that, but I know some of you are big Chardonnay drinkers. I've been known to be myself. So if you have chosen one that has a lot of oak, as I suggested, that's a, a lot of body, even that can stand up to the steak but also complement the vinaigrette that's gonna be going on um, our incredible salad. Yeah, and it's an interesting meal that we're having because it's so full of flavor, thanks in large part to the PS Flavor blend that you made for spring. So if you don't know, um, Pam develops these amazing spice blends. Um, I get together with our other Spice Girls, as we call ourselves, Jenna, who's gonna be taking questions for you. So if you have any questions, throughout the class, just type them and Jenna will be your voice. Um, but Pam makes this amazing blend for every season. And this season, we're highlighting porcini pepper because of how beautiful it is on fresh spring vegetables. Amazing, it really is. It's not just amazing on fresh spring vegetables, but it just brings out this incredible essence and layer of flavor. We're of course, crusting a steak, a steak of your choice. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But the fact that it's so beautifully, as you say, pairs with um, some of the other items we're putting it with. We're making a beautiful, creamy horseradish sauce, which sounds rather indulgent, but it's going to absolutely be mind-blowing when you see how it's actually made. You've gotten a peek if you've looked at the recipe. But the porcini pepper is delicious in that as well. Yeah, and the porcini pepper has this key ingredient in it, you hear it in the name, and it's mushrooms. And, you know, I haven't always been a fan of mushrooms yet, yes. though I believe fully that I'm well on my way. But you talk about mushrooms all the time and how much wellness we get from them, and I feel like I've been missing out. So I'm right. really excited that now we have a blend that has mushrooms in them, so I'm getting the wellness maybe without the texture issue that I sometimes have. So that's what bothers you and probably bothers some of you as well. If you're not yet a fan of mushrooms, I will tell you, I talk about mushrooms all the time, all across the country, the planet for that matter. I help restaurant chefs, hotel chefs, theme park chefs, learn how to use something called the blend, which is a blend of, of animal protein, steak or ground beef, um, chicken, turkey, but blended with ground roasted mushrooms. That blend, about 70-30, gives this incredible 
incredible, not only wellness boost to what would be an iconic burger, but also gives an umami boost. And that as well is what you miss out when you don't yet celebrate mushrooms. The porcini pepper is going to give that opportunity. And that's actually what we call it kind of behind the scenes porcini pepper but we call it umami bomb if you don't know what umami is it's considered the fifth taste and it's the unctuousness in food it's the craveability in food beyond sweet sour salty bitter it's it's what brings you back for yet another taste and mushrooms are just screaming in that natural umami, especially when you blend them with something like beef, which we're doing today. But yet there's more in the porcini pepper. In addition to the porcini mushroom powder, there's also smoked paprika, there's a little bit of lemon, there's onion, there's garlic. It's just this incredible umami and flavor bomb. So I think you're gonna love it, not only this month with this dish, but next month, we're going to be making a porcini pepper polenta. That's quite a mouthful. It is, I'm excited mm -hmm. about it. I wanted to do just a little bit of housekeeping as okay. we get started. One of the things that Pam and I are really big on with these cooking classes is making it a no stress kitchen. So if you have any technical difficulties, your internet starts to bleep out or just goes out, um, make sure you have your recipe ready and just follow your recipe. She's written it in a beautiful way so that you can go with no guesswork. So just follow along. If our internet goes out, we will jump right back on as soon as possible and meet up with you where you are. Um, we also wanted to tell you a little bit about a giveaway we have coming up. Yes, indeed. So Cutco Cutlery has just been amazing fans of the PS mm -hmm. Flavor Club and they have given us the opportunity to give away a piece of cutlery each month. And not just any. I know, this month we are bringing it big um, for spring with the seven inch Santoku knife. So we're gonna be using that tonight, giving it away later. Um, you have for the rest of the month, April, to make your dish, mm -hmm. but not just make your dish, take a picture of it with your spice kit. So whether it is the cute little red mini kit, or your seasonal box, whichever one you went with, get a picture of your meal with it and that'll give you an entry. Yes. But we decided also, if you get in with your picture, we'll give you an extra entry. A little extra bonus point. I like that because who wants to get in with their picture? Well, some of you do. Yeah, I know. we hope you do. And there's been a few people that actually couldn't be with us tonight live, so they got on, got the recipe, and have already prepared the dish and have already posted it. So yes. we might need to give them a bonus point we too. We might do it's that. pretty cool. I think pretty so. Cool. Now, one of the things we heard from the Windsor was that you're the thing that helped most while you were cooking, getting these step-by-step -step cooking classes from Pam, was having a close-up. So I am actually going to step on the other side of the island with the Nicole cam and get some really great close-up shots while she's cooking. So without further ado, boy, it listen is time to that. To begin. It is indeed time to begin. And again, I hope that many of you have already had the chance to do a little bit of pre-pap prep. We put um, a list of the kinds of things to pull together in the mise en place. We've put a list of the kind of equipment to have. Again, if you get into this and say, wait, I, I should have done a whole lot better with that, no problem. There's always next month. No problem. You can also just carry on and then go back because every single one of our classes is archived. And um, we're excited about that, not just on Facebook, but also on YouTube. So very fun things that you can watch and, and share, which is fantastic. So I have a pot that is just steaming away and it's begging for some green beans to go in it to be blanched. But before that happens, because the oven is indeed already hot, um, set at 400, I want to start with getting the vegetables roasted. They're going to take around 12, 10, 12 minutes. And so with that, I want to get them into the oven. Part of that pre-prep was to be able to do baby potatoes. These are baby gourmet red potatoes. Um, oftentimes I use a mixture of them. I use purple Peruvians, fingerlings. This is what the market had. That's what we're having tonight. Um, cut them in half unless they're a little bit bigger. And if that's the case, we quartered them instead. Um, the half is just about right. I really wanna have even 
size particles that are going to be roasting. If you have some that are large, some that are small, they'll cook at different times and we wanna have equivalent cooking. So try to get them about the same size, may need a quarter, may need to half, depending on what was made with that particular vegetable. This is classic roasting vegetables one-on-one. -on -one. First of all, get that pan in the oven, get it smoking hot before you even add the potatoes to it or later the tomatoes. Do just a little drizzle of olive oil and we're going to use some of our um, adobo. Our adobo blend is what is gonna go into our great salad that we're putting together. And the adobo, just a teaspoon here on the vegetables, will give just this incredible roasted flavor to the whole of it. Um, toss the potatoes in the adobo and that drizzle of olive oil and they're ready to go. Um, make sure your potatoes and your tomatoes, whatever you might do, are actually dry. They have a lot of water on them. Um, they'll end up steaming. Well, we don't want them to steam when they actually hit the sheet pan, which is again, what's in the oven. Um, by the way, when you open the oven, the skillet that you have out um, ready to use to cook your porcini steak, slip that into the oven as well so it can begin to heat up. We're going to just put these right onto that very, very hot sheet pan. Wow, hear that sizzle. Hear that sizzle. Um, spread them out to a nice, even layer, and you're good to go. It will let you then close that up, get your tomatoes ready, because then the tomatoes are gonna go in as well. I wanted to get the potatoes in first, why? Well, we know potatoes are much firmer of a vegetable. So if I can get those started while I'm then, just a little head start, getting the tomatoes ready, we're good. And again, with that, it's almost rinse and repeat. We've got the potatoes in, now add the tomatoes. Um, you can use cherry tomatoes, you can do grape tomatoes. Um, these are sweet cherry tomatoes, whichever you might have and have available, but exactly the same process. You don't cut these in half because as you'll see later with the salad, I'm really looking for that to be able to give you just exactly um, almost a melting of those tomatoes. They'll still hold a little bit of their shape. Um, with that, you're gonna add another teaspoon of the adobo seasoning. And very similarly, just toss that with the olive oil that I added and get that also right into the oven, nestled right next to the potatoes. Now, if you want to use two sheet pans, that is fine to do. You would have both of them in and you could have them separate. Um, I figured, well, who wants to watch that extra pan, right? It's always good. So we're gonna do a little bit of um, economics here and let them both be roasting at the same time. And again, I have my pan, as I mentioned, that I'm gonna be using for the por porcini steak already in the oven. So closed up, it's gonna take us about 10 or 12 minutes, which is perfect because in that time, we'll be able to have the green beans cooked, we'll be able to have the vinaigrette made, and then we'll be able to start on our steak. So in the process, this little water that's steaming away is steaming away because it's going to be the blanching liquid for our green beans. Um, boiling water, just add about a teaspoon of salt to that water and add your green beans. Um, as you saw in your prep list, the ideal for the green beans, about 12 ounces of them, is to already have them washed and snipped. Now, truth, I bought them already washed and snipped. I went ahead and ran them through one more wash just, just because I could. But once done, just put them right into that boiling salted water and begin the blanching process. Now, if you've ever blanched vegetables before, it's a great thing to do because what it does is it seals the chlorophyll into the green bean. That's what we're doing. You can blanch spinach, blanch asparagus, 
Blanche Brussels sprouts, anything that you're going to be using those in, a, in another way, in this case, we're going to be putting them into our salad. I want that vibrant spring green. If I didn't do that, they would end up turning a little more olive green, not what we're looking for at all. But blanching really does its job. About 30 minutes or 30 minutes, 30 seconds is all that we would leave them in that blanching water if you're wanting them to be very crisp. That's what I like in this particular potato salad. I want the crunch of that green bean. But if you prefer your green beans a little more tender, can certainly leave it in a little bit longer. This actually just becomes a cooking liquid. But for right now, it's a blanching liquid for me. Again, these aren't your granny's green beans, the ones that are cooked to death. What these are instead is this incredible incredible freshness statement for the salad that's yet to be. I have an ice water bath, which is simply that, ice with some water, because I want to remove the green beans from this boiling water and get them right into my ice bath. Why? Because it seals in the chlorophyll. It stops the cooking process and immediately seals all of that color right where it should be, which is fantastic. So I'm gonna get those in and I'm actually just gonna let them sit and cool down because later they'll be joined by um, the potatoes and the tomatoes. While that's cooling in the ice bath, get the, the temperature off of that, let's move on and let's do the vinaigrette that we're gonna put together. I hope that what you're seeing with this is it's all really fast cooking, but it's fast for a reason. It's fast because you've already have done the mise en place. You've already put together um, the items that you need. This is not the time to go running and see if you have some Dijon mustard. This is not the time to say, oh, don't tell me I'm out of red wine vinegar. If that happens, no problem. As Nicole said earlier, this is a stress-free cooking zone, so you can use golden balsamic instead. You can use rice wine vinegar instead, but if you've already have done the mise en place and already have your prep in place, it gives you that opportunity to literally do assembling, which is why we're gonna be able to do this entire dish for you in a out a little less than an hour, which is awesome, especially if you're hungry and especially if you're getting ready to serve um, a very hungry crowd indeed. So with this, I'm going to start with making um, the vinaigrette. The vinaigrette is a pretty simple one. I do vinaigrettes all the time and I really encourage you to think about a vinaigrette as one of the easiest things you can do in your kitchen and really never be tempted to buy one again because a vinaigrette is so simplistic to put together, so fresh, and it gives you the opportunity, if you do it my way, um, is to do an upside down vinaigrette. Rather than a three to one, which is three parts oil, one part vinegar, I do one that's completely upside down. I add much more vinegar, and with that, to give just a little bit of softening, I also add a little bit of honey. In addition to the vinegar, adding some lemon juice, about two tablespoons. I've already plopped the, uh, the um, lemon into the microwave. The microwave of lemon for 30 seconds does an incredible job of bursting open the cells within that lemon to give just this incredible spurt of juice using your handy citrus squeezer, which many of you have from, from last season's class, literally just squeeze that right into your dressing. So now we have, can you believe all of that? It's really amazing. phenomenal. So the lemon juice is there. We have the red wine vinegar. We're also going to add the honey, as I mentioned. The honey just helps to kind of balance and even provides a little bit of thickening and nutrients, believe it or not, in and of itself. In addition to that, a good amount of mustard. This really is a mustard vinaigrette. Um, generally, I'll use a small amount of mustard in every vinaigrette because it becomes an emulsifier. It emulsifies by binding together 
in any science experiment, the oil and the water. In this case, it binds the oil we're later going to add with the vinegar and the lemon juice, the water that's contained with that. It's what keeps the vinaigrette together, keeps it from breaking, but also gives this incredible velvety kind of quality to the vinaigrette. Um, once you have the mustard, the honey, the vinegar, the lemon juice in play, all that you're needing to do is get that nicely whisked together and then add your final one teaspoon of the adobo seasoning. We have it already on our vegetables that are in the oven, roasting away and being happy. Now we're going to add it here and it's so delicious. If you've not tasted our adobo before, it's really one of our go-to kitchen blends. It's loaded with all things nutraceutical. It's almost like your wellness in a jar because it's turmeric and smoked paprika and cumin. It has just beautiful, beautiful properties to it. Once that's in, and you always wanna get your seasonings in before you now take the step to add the oil. It enables them to just have a little more um, permeation throughout the vinaigrette. Now, you'll take your olive oil and with a very slow, slow stream, you just begin to drizzle that olive oil right into the vinegar lemon juice seasoning mixture. Very slow stream, whisking with one hand, drizzling with the other. You could do this in a blender, very easy to do. You could do it with an immersion blender, also easy. I just love being able to throw a whisk into the dishwasher and not have to worry about any other equipment in this process, especially when it's just so easy to do. Um, we called for about a half a cup of olive oil. We use an extra virgin olive oil, but as you're drizzling, you'll start to see um, the vinaigrette thickening and coming together. I usually stop at that point and with my trusty tasting spoon, and if you don't know, you should always have tasting spoons because the top chefs around the world are those that taste their food. Always want to know that there's always some individual differences. That honey might not have been quite as sweet. The vinegar might have had a little more acidity to it. So a taste, always good. And oh my goodness, that is so delicious. When you make this and taste it, you'll decide no more. I'm going to use this all the time. If you don't want the adobo seasoning, you could use Creole instead. Um, the Creole is kind of a go-to kitchen seasoning as well. I'm just in love with adobo right now in so, much, so many ways. Once that's done, it's all ready for what's going to come next with this salad, which is to add the hot vegetables that are roasting right to this blend. So I'm going to move this back here, and it's time to check the vegetables that are happily roasting away in the oven. So you see what's happened already. You're getting just beautiful color starting to happen on the vegetables, both the potatoes that are starting to get little brown bits. Those tomatoes are starting to get just a little bit blistered. Um, the tomatoes will be good to go whenever you're ready to go, but it's always good to check um, the potatoes and see if they're what you would call for tender. And they just about are. I'm probably only gonna give them about another two minutes and then we'll go from there. And while we're waiting for those to finish, it's a good time to get started on the horseradish um, sauce because I will tell you, I think you are gonna fall in love with this. I did. Um, we put it together and it's immediately become not just my go-to sauce, but a go-to dip. It's absolutely delicious to have with carrots or with cucumbers, radishes, pita chips. There's something absolutely magical about it. And what's really incredible is it's not just a flavor boost in and of itself, but it's also such a wellness package. We're using a Greek yogurt. So with that, we're getting all the probiotics that are in Greek yogurt, but then we're adding Prebiotics. Prebiotics are coming from the horseradish that we're adding. Horseradish that should be a horseradish sauce. It's just prepared horseradish, which means it's fresh horseradish that's already been grated. You want to be a little 
ginger, if you will, with adding the horseradish. Some horseradishes are extremely hot and um, once you add it, you really can't take it out. So very important to maybe add it a little bit at a time. I have made this where it's delicious, but so fiery hot. And I look at the horseradish and say, you, you did a bad thing, horseradish. Good to be able to just add it in, taste it, and then add a little bit more. We tend to do about three ounces. In addition to the horseradish, we also use garlic, about two cloves of garlic. And you can either use your incredible Cutco knife to be able to mince that garlic just really very, very finely. You can also use the zester that many of you received if you did your spring kit. Um, it's, a, it's an extendable zester. There's a little green button right on the top and literally it just extends out. It's great to be able to keep in drawers because it just doesn't take up so much room. And you can use this, although you think about using a zester more for lemons and for limes, you can also use it to literally grate your garlic. And you just do the same exact principle, literally just rub right against that garlic. I'm gonna go with a little larger clove at that moment. And what's happening is you're getting all of the grated garlic um, into the um, area of the zester that is kind of your holding area, you can then have just such a fine grate that you're not biting into garlic, which a lot of people don't enjoy, particularly raw garlic. Instead, you have this really, really beautiful garlic zest, if you will. A loud bump, hit it against your, your um, mixture, and mix away. We're also gonna be adding porcini pepper. As I mentioned before, the porcini pepper in this just gives that umami boost, as we've talked about now so much, but it too gives that incredible wellness package to this whole dish. Um, we're gonna be adding two tablespoons of the porcini pepper to this, and then we're gonna sprinkle just a little bit more on it once we actually get to our plating. After you get that mixed up, takes on this really beautiful, beautiful aromatic, both the horseradish together with the porcini pepper. Good time to then do a little taste and see how you've done with the heat. You may need to add the remaining amount of the horseradish, which I'm gonna do. Um, just think it can use that extra heat. Again, the total amount in this is about three ounces. And I'm going to interrupt. Will Please. you tell us again how much porcini pepper goes in that? Two teaspoons. Two teaspoons. Two teaspoons. Okay, cool. Yes. As the recipe calls for. It looks delicious. It does. And well, it I also be, know it tastes delicious. Yes, because we got <laughs> it a little bit earlier. So really, really nice. So that is all mixed. It's all ready to go. And it's all ready for the plating. So at this point, we can feel pretty good that we have just the right roasting on our vegetables. So I'm gonna move on to those. Let this go back and get our start. Probably time for a little sip of Zen Pindel, what do you think? Yeah. I think so. And so we've now finished blanching the green beans. Mm -hmm. We've made the creamy horseradish. We've got our potatoes and tomatoes both in the oven right and we out. have our pan for the steak in the oven getting hot getting hot but we're going to get it hotter still so these vegetables coming out right from the oven um, they've roasted beautifully and you could use these in any way you could imagine i mean just eat them alone actually drizzled with a little bit of that creamy horseradish sauce or using those potatoes as a dip. I do that often with roasted fingerling potatoes. Use those as a dip for this as compared to fries. Um, the tomatoes you can use in so, so many applications. I'm gonna turn the heat up on the oven though to 500 because I'm wanting the pan that's there truly smoking hot and it's going to go up just a little bit higher while we're putting this salad together. And that will be awesome. So carefully, because these are obviously quite hot, we're gonna put these right into the vinaigrette that we've already prepared. 
Um, the reason you want to put them in hot is because they literally uptake that vinaigrette right into them when they're coming in hot. Same thing applies if you're doing a pasta salad. Um, this summer, we're hoping to do an orzo salad, and you'll see the same principle applying. You want to get all of that good roasted goodness. If there's little bits of char that are on the roasting pan, scrape that right in because all that is are just little bits of flavor. Perfect. Again, right into that hot vinaigrette, which right now kind of looks like a hot mess, but it's going to end up being absolutely incredible. We have our green beans that are already cool as they've been sitting in the ice water bath. So we have the vinaigrette in play, literally going to just put a little bit of draining of the green beans right into the blend. This is, could be a warm salad, which we're certainly going to serve it as, but you can also refrigerate it. It's a beautiful cold potato salad in addition to the warm one. So I think you're gonna find this quite versatile for the summer that's yet to come. It's a good start for spring. Once in place, literally just toss that together. Um, if you have a little bit of fresh um, parsley or fresh mint, fresh basil, any of that you can certainly add as well, but there's so much flavor already in play coming just from the vinaigrette. Um, Jenna actually is growing some parsley um, in her backyard, so she offered that we have just a little bit of it. So we're gonna use our kitchen shears, um, and these are fantastic, also from Cutco, and literally just cut some of that fresh parsley right in. We'll use some parsley later for a garnish too, but since Jenna provided it, we'd like to use what we have. So we'll cut that in and then add the final flavor boost, which is the feta cheese. Feta is just absolutely beautiful in this salad because it gives that wonderful creaminess, that tang because that's a little more acid. That is a lower fat cheese, which kind of surprises people. Um, lower fat than traditional ones, but such an incredible flavor bomb. Unbelievable. You're just gonna absolutely put all of that together. Fine to reserve a little bit of it if you want to use it for a garnish later. What I did was just add it all in, but in traditional ways, I would usually reserve just a bit of that because it's just such a beautiful flavor contrast, but color contrast as well. Once it's done, you are good to go. And as I said, you can make this in advance. You can let it stay at room temperature. You can get it into the refrigerator, whichever you would like to do. I can't wait to plate this with our steak, but that means we need to cook our steak. So I'll put that aside. I'll get this back here. And the steak is calling our name. Now, as I said, we already have in play the skillet that's in the oven. That's gonna be what we're going to use to really do the charring on our steak. I'm gonna go ahead and get the um, temperature turned on for that skillet when I get it out, but first, I'm gonna do the seasoning of this. Again, all about the heat. Now, you could absolutely do this on your grill, or if you have a green egg, it would be delicious, but we're doing it in our kitchen, and we're doing it by adding just a little spritz of olive oil. I use, um, little squirt bottles for olive oil because I'm not gonna be adding any additional fat to the pan. This is such a high heat cooking. I want the oil to actually be on the meat as compared to on the pan itself. Then you wanna literally and liberally sprinkle the porcini pepper right onto the filet. I did use fillets, went to the market. They had some beautiful ones at a really beautiful price. But I know some of you have opted to do a sirloin or do a ribeye. I also know a few of you are using salmon. Um, delicious with this dish. And I know a few of you that have a plant-based diet are using tofu or tempeh, also delicious to do. The porcini pepper, it just works. It works on vegetables, it works on meat. Notice that as I'm sprinkling, I'm really covering. It's the amount that your recipe calls for, but the reason we've chosen that amount is we really wanna cover every 
inch, every centimeter of the steak with the porcini because it's what's going to caramelize and give all of the flavor into the steak as it's charring and crusting. Let's get our very hot pan out. Again, up in 7500, but it goes straight onto the very hot burner. And we're gonna, before it gets any cooling down at all, add the fillets right to it. I'm gonna use this to do that. And immediately you start to get the sizzle. And that sizzle is your sign that, oh yeah, this pan is indeed smoking hot. Once you get it into the pan, just let them be. Let them be happy, let them rest because what's gonna happen is you're gonna get that sear that's going on the bottom of the steak. You're gonna do that before you do the flip. The flip is what's going to then let that next side get its sear, but we're not gonna to try to cook it right here on the stove. Instead, remember that oven is still very, very hot. We're gonna put it back into that 500 degree oven and that's going to cook it internally. We have the sear, but now we need a little bit more. We want to let it do for just about a minute or two as we've done. Do the flip, and you see that beautiful sear that's already starting, which is fantastic. Let that go for another um, just minute or so, and then into the oven it goes. We're going to be checking our temperature of it. Um, I'm hoping that you have a very handy little meat thermometer, really critical because the meat thermometer is what tells you that yes, the meat is the temperature you're looking for. If you like medium rare, we're gonna be pulling this out at about 130, 135 degrees. There'll be some carryover cooking while we let it rest. Um, if you like your meat a little more well done, um, you like it more in the, one, in the medium type range, you would let it go more to 140 to 135. And if you like it very well done, no judgment if you do, it's not only a stress-free kitchen, it's a judgment-free kitchen, um, cook it as much as you want, but you might be taking it out more at the 150, 155. Carryover cooking um, usually takes it up about another five degrees if you let it rest for about three to five minutes. We'll get that off and we can rest for a minute. It's a perfect time to start thinking about your plating if you've not already chosen that. We spend a lot of time thinking about plating, don't we, Nicole? We do. Which plate we're gonna use, even what color, mm -hmm. because we know that more than just the taste affects the meal. Mm -hmm. The color, the temperature, the crunch, even the people that we're with affects yes. our meal. It really, really does. We um, tend to look for plates that are really going to play off the color um, of what's happening in the dish itself. We have a question mm -hmm. and Paulette Stinson is wondering, is the oven still at 500? The oven is still at 500. Okay, so we're cooking our steak at 500 to that temperature that we're looking okay, for. Okay, great. Yes, and so generally because the steak, the pan was so hot when the steak went in, it's gonna be kind of moving up to that temperature really in about three to five minutes. Okay. So I'm really ready to start plating, which is fun. Um, now in the recipe, we called for four fillets, mm -hmm. but since we're cooking for me and you, yes. we're doing two. But Sorry, if, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> if you were doing four, mm -hmm. you would just do exactly the same thing. Same exactly temperature. the same thing. Just make sure that you are not letting the steaks or the fillets touch each other. You really want to give them some room to breathe and room to play. We say that in the recipe. So again, depending on the size, you may need to do a couple of pans with it's a filet, that's really rarely the case. And if it was a, another cut of meat, you may end up slicing it anyway. So sometimes just two is about what you would use. All right, that's great. So we chose this yellow plate because mm -hmm. we were screaming spring and yes. so excited about these spring meals. Um, if someone's just now getting their potatoes going, mm -hmm. Could they do those at 500 or is it important that those be at the 400? Um, the 500 is fine. Um, what you would want to make sure you do though is put them more on the top 
because that underheat, unless you have a convection oven that you're using, that underheat at 500 could maybe toast those potatoes on the outside a little bit, a little bit quicker than what they'll cook on the inside. All okay. right, makes Thank sense. You. Absolutely. So we did choose a yellow plate. Um, sometimes we'll use black plates, we use white plates. We're always seeking to try to bring out the best of color and even think a little bit about the shape that goes on as well. Another question. So yes, Jenna. Do another question. Uh, Rhonda says that her steaks can sometimes be tough, and will this method help to make sure it's moist, tender, and flavorful? Oh, Rhonda, yes, it will. Your steaks will never be better. What you're going to find is by searing them in this way, you're not trying to cook them unevenly. You get that outside surface sear, but then the oven is cooking very evenly within. You want to choose your meat to be tender cuts. Of course, filet, there's nothing more tender than that. But even a top sirloin, a ribeye of any kind, when it's done in that method, gives you all of the wonderful uh, moisture that you're really seeking. So while we took that question, I have a feeling it's time to check our steaks and see how they're doing cooking away. So again, temperature we're looking for, because we tend to like ours more at the medium rare, we're going to be seeking these to be right at the 125 to 130 mark. So let's go through that again. Okay. So if someone's a medium rare person, mm -hmm. they're going to be looking for 125 to 130 for the coming, center. Coming out of the oven. Okay. Because then we'll have the carryover cooking that will take it a little bit more. And if they're more of a medium person. Um, they would pull it out about 135 to 140. So you're okay. going about 10 degrees each time. Okay. And these are really ready to come out. Great. And are very happy that we checked on them. And while we get them out, what we're also wanting to do is get them out of the oven and also get them out of the very hot pan so that they can rest. Um, not going to need to rest long. They'll rest while they're coming to the plate as well. But by getting them out of the pan, we give it a chance for all of the juices that are within to be able to um, kind of dis, dis, take all the way through the muscle protein rather than when you cut into it, immediately losing those juices on the cutting board, which happens ever so often. So well, they right look there. absolutely amazing. They smell absolutely yeah. amazing too. We laugh often that scratch and sniff would be very dangerous. I think that we'd all be wanting to eat porcini pepper all the time. All the time. There is no doubt about that. So we're going to let those rest and I'm going to start some of the basic plating. So many of you know that I love to do a little swoosh on a plate, a swoosh or a schmear, because Particularly with this, we're not just painting the plate. What we're doing instead is making the sauce become an under um, sauce for the beautiful filet or steak that's atop it. To do a swoosh or a schmear, just get a nice little mound um, right onto your plate and then with your spoon, literally drag the spoon across it. Um, let it kind of fan out a little bit. We're not looking for a perfect little swoosh. What we're looking for is really a beautiful way, a bed, if you will, for the filet to then sit atop. Once we've done that, we have our salad already ready. It's just been sitting here very happy. And so now we're going to add that to the plate as well right next to that little schmear swoosh. Now with any leftover salad, mm -hmm. how long could that stay good in the refrigerator? Um, beautifully, because it's just gonna get better and better mm -hmm. and better. Three to four days okay. um, will be great. It won't last that long because people are loving it so much. Um, the, the green beans are just so, craveable. You just kind of keep going back for more. And then again, with the potatoes, absolutely beautiful. Um, you have a choice with the fillets. Once you get um, the plate all ready to go and, and ready to have the fillet added, you can either just simply take the fillet and, and have it whole and lay it just up against the salad, right onto the swoosh, and you call it good. 
but you could also slice the filet. And I think any of you that saw the picture of our dish, that's what we opted to do. Knowing that a lot of you were using another kind of steak than a filet, the small filet is perfect there, but if it's larger, it's gonna just you know, be mountainous on your plate itself. So this is one way to do, um, take some of that beautiful parsley that you have put already in the salad and just add a, just a little twig of that just to give a little bit of extra beauty and you have a really incredible plate. But let's see what we would do if we sliced it instead and that will work out great. So I'm gonna sit this here. Actually, Nicole, I'm gonna give that to you. I, I might wait to eat it until we're all may done. Not. We'll see. So then same exact process. I'm not gonna do really anything different with this. I'm gonna take my swoosh right across the plate. I'm gonna similarly mound up the green bean and potato and tomato salad. Just kind of let that fall where it will. This is, again, one of the beautiful parts of plating food that's this beautiful is it's, it's simple food and it's simply delicious. So having that ability to let the food kind of scream and sing its song all on its own is really what we're trying to do. With your ever so sharp knife, um, we are gonna just do a little slicing of this. And we're gonna slice it at an angle. Um, the angle will give you an opportunity to see the, the meat and to see the fibers and to see how perfectly you cooked this, charred on the outside, but then absolutely beautiful on the inside, whatever temperature that you were looking for it to be done. I'm gonna lift this up and literally just fan it right out onto our plate. And we have now a little different presentation. Also taking a little bit of the flat leaf parsley, adding that to it, and we have another incredible dish. You can serve a little bit of the creamy horseradish sauce to the side. I think you're gonna find that your guest and you will be going back for more, maybe looking for a potato or two to be able to dip into it. So I oftentimes will serve just little cups of the horseradish sauce on the table itself so that people can add just a little bit more just for fun. Now, something that I love with almost all of our spices, especially when we're doing them on meats, is to sprinkle mm -hmm. some of whichever you used so it's got a fresh one also yes. on top, just that added little texture. Um, the ones that have a little bit of turbinado sugar, you even get that little bit of crunch mm -hmm. with it. But the porcini pepper seems extra amazing. It's got that minced onion in it. It's got just a little bit of everything that when you sprinkle it, it seems to do something extra. What's so amazing is that was the nicest way Nicole could ever have to say, hey mom, remember you are gonna sprinkle the porcini pepper right on the plate because that is what your recipe calls for. And you're exactly right, Nicole. It just gives this little extra, not just aromatic to it, but every time you take a bite of that steak, a bite of the creamy horseradish sauce, you're kind of dragging it through that little bit of a sprinkle, absolutely delicious. So mm. we'll sprinkle it on the other one as well, but I'm pretty happy with it. Very happy. I'm gonna set this here and come join you. Mm -hmm. I loved watching this meal come together. So many people um, have been very excited about this meal. We did a poll on the cooking club to see what meal are people most excited about. This one had some high rankings, but let me tell you. Oh, next month. May one. May one. Mm -hmm. It was the chili lime salmon um, with the porcini pepper polenta and the pan seared asparagus. So we'll be doing that on May the 8th. Which is very soon. That's just a few weeks, actually. It is. We generally seem to have four to five weeks between, mm -hmm. but with the way the days fell, it's just about three weeks. So get ready for a lot of delicious and nutritious coming very soon, um, starting with tonight. Yeah, we hope so that good. your meal has turned out exactly how you wanted it. Please do not forget to take a picture of your meal with your box whether it's your mini bread box with your monthly spices or your seasonal box, the mint green one, take a picture of it, post it, 
get an entry for this amazing Cutco Santoku knife. put night. yourself in it and get a little extra bonus point. And if, if people are not watching this live, again, as you said, they have until the end of the month to do that, um, but also have all the opportunity to ask questions. So even though Jenna was taking questions live as they were coming in, you can do that in the Facebook group. Ask questions. If you're in the middle of cooking something, ask a question. We're really here to, to make you a top chef, not just preparing delicious food, but delicious and nutritious. And we don't expect a lot of leftovers for this. I know that I had it before um, when we were testing this out. I may have finished every single possible bite on my plate. And went back for more. Yeah, I might just saying, that. Just, just saying, saying. just saying, just um, saying. But if you do have leftovers and you imagine something new that you want to do, we love making one meal and turning it into two or three, whatever that may be for you. And I think they will have some of the veggies left. Yeah, so let absolutely. us know what you do. Um, more than anything, we hope that you love it. We hope that you had a stress-free time. And um, I think we should leave with a little cheers. We should. You're going to need your wine to be able to get oh, that. Oh, here's yours. I know it. Wine. I saw her eyeing it. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Jenna. So, cheers to you. And to spring. To spring. And cheers to you. And bon appetit. I can't wait to see you next time.